Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Southern Four Wheel Drives TechNet. Tonight we're gonna we have Jay. I'm I'm gonna try to talk Jay into giving away a free membership tonight to Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Uh, I'll pop up a little message here in a minute, and uh, well, actually, let me just pop it up now, and uh, just to remind them to tell us if they're a member or not, and. Right. Uh, Maybe if I can get the numbers to work out, I will. Uh, I will announce the winner at the end tonight. Yep. Let's give. Let's give somebody a a, a membership to Southern. You, okay. It, and uh, Jay, if you'll hang on, there may be some questions for you about coal mine or something later. Absolutely, we'll, we'll I'll answer them at the end. All righty. Good evening, Mike. Good evening. What's up, Facebook world? Oh wow! This is exciting. We finally getting getting to go with another TechNet. So, uh, so Mike, tell us tell us a little bit about TechNet. What about what about BFG? So, all right, for those of you that are new, BFG BF Goodrich Tires has given us a set of tires to give away along with these this tech, this season of TechNet. So, what you have to do is watch this live stream and all of our TechNet live streams, but Al's going to throw something up on the screen, a comment for you to make during the TechNet. Sometimes it's, it's you know, one of the tread lightly principles, or it's as simple as where do you live, right? But if you comment during the live stream, that enters you for a chance to win not one, not two, not three, not four, but five BFG tires, up to a 37-inch tire. KM3s or KO2s, you get your choice to pick. Um, we all want good traction on the trails, so it's a great opportunity to win a set of tires. And each TechNet this season that you watch and comment on enters you for a chance to win those tires. We'll be holding the drawing at Trail Fest. You do not have to be present to win. So make sure you guys are watching these TechNets, commenting live when Al throws up the little phrase up there that you need to comment, but you got to comment live. And also, most of all, make sure that you are sending BFG a message on Facebook, snail mail, I don't care, smoke signals, but send them a message and thank them for supporting Southern Four Wheel Drive Association and our commitment to education. Not only did they support our TechNet, Mike, they're also supporting our other events big time. Also, uh, they'll be giving away They'll be giving us a set of tires to raffle off to our premium members at Trail Fest. They'll also be giving us another set of tires to raffle off at Trail Fest in a general raffle. Warren is another one of our sponsors, and they've been real supportive. They've given us a lot of a lot of items to give away. Last season, every every uh, I think every TechNet we gave away a Warren accessory. We'll be giving some more of those away between now and the time. We have Trail Fest, so uh, so stay tuned. What else before we get started, Mike? Anything? Uh, Just a brief overview, guys. Tonight's TechNet is going to be on trail etiquette, and this is this is a little bit of a touchy subject, right? Because there are some things about trail etiquette that that you know we we just got to get in there get our hands dirty and talk about. So this episode, I think, is really important. This is probably one of one of the most important episodes that we've held um, just because we're really going to talk about how we should be acting on the trails. Well, good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop off the screen and let you run with it, Mike. All right, guys. So talking about trail etiquette, right? How should we act on the trails? Well, first off, we've got the five tread lightly principles, right? Tread lightly has really laid out really well the five tread lightly principles that we should follow on the trail first and foremost um tread right in their name it's an acronym the t is travel responsibly right so traveling responsibly on designated routes what does that mean when we're in a vehicle right well when we're in a vehicle and we are traveling responsibly that means that we are staying on routes that are meant for our full-size off-highway vehicles, or if we're in a side-by-side -side or on an ATV, we're on trails that are designated for those styles of vehicles. Also, being responsible on the trail means that we are being prepared, right? 
We've brought all the necessary tools, first aid kits, water, everything that we need uh, in the event that there is some type of emergency on the trail. But we are prepared to be where we're at. Our, and this is one of the most important ones, I think, for the four-wheel drive community. That's respect the rights of others, right? So understanding that we may be recreating in our four-wheel drive vehicles somewhere where there's other user groups like horseback riders or mountain bikers, hikers, campers, all other different types of user groups, fishermen, hunters, all those different types of things, but making sure that we are respecting those user groups when we're out there. And we're going to talk about some ways to do that as, as we kind of move on. E-educate yourself. And this is super important. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, go take an off-road driving class or go take an off-road recovery class, although those are important, I think, um, most definitely because a better driver, less impact to, uh, to terrain, also proper recovery techniques so you're not damaging trees and things like that. But it's also educating yourself about where you're going right? If you're going to a new area, make sure you understand what routes are legal for your vehicle. Make sure you understand the best time of season to go, uh, best time of the year to go so that you're not interrupting during the wet season or maybe some type of, of uh, special um, uh, migratory with some type of animals, right? Maybe it's even understanding where you're going has some type of specific environmental impact, you know, um, for instance, for boaters, they may go to a lake that has some type of invasive species, aquatic invasive species. So they need to properly clean their boats. So they need to educate themselves about that before they move that species to another body of water. Same thing for us in off-road vehicles. If we go somewhere uh, that has kudzu and then we get off the trail and get some of that wrapped around our tire and then take it somewhere else and wash our vehicle off, well, now it's planted and that stuff will grow anywhere, right? So making sure we're not transferring those invasive species, but educating ourselves about where we're going and how our vehicles operate and how we should drive them. Avoid sensitive areas. This, I think, is, is one that does get a little touchy as far as the five principles because, you know, we all like to go out. We all like a challenge. But sometimes when it rains, you know, even though the trails are harder, when it rains and we go out and we get to spinning wheels or things like that, maybe we're doing more damage to those trails than good, right? So maybe think about the times when you're going out. Also with sensitive areas, again, areas that have special ecological or environmental circumstances, maybe some type of endangered species we need to watch out for, whether plant life or animals, but avoiding those sensitive areas. And last, but certainly not least, but doing our part. Now, we all know do our part, you know, pick up our trash, clean up after ourselves and things like that. But most importantly, most importantly about doing your part is communicating the tread lightly message, the cons conservation message, right? And it's not going out there and beating them over the head with your high lift jack handle, right? It's approaching people and talking to them about tread lightly and about conservation and how we can keep these areas open, going out and telling them about Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, right? So that's just as important as it is cleaning up after ourselves, communicating that message, because a lot of people just don't know, right? Especially now with, with the pandemic and everything going on, the outdoor recreation industry is going nuts. Everybody wants to get outdoors because they can, right? because it's a safe place to go. So the impact is huge. We need to communicate that tread lightly message with everyone. So make sure that you are doing your part. All right, so that's the five tread lightly principles. Let's talk about some trail etiquette things that apply to us more specifically with our vehicles. And some of these are from tread lightly. Others are things that I've learned over the years in trail rides and things that I've learned are really good etiquette, um, especially in OHB parks, um, more heavily trafficked areas. So let's talk about yielding, right? And this really applies to areas where we're in encountering all different user groups and especially respecting the rights of others. Tread Lightly has an awesome little little yield triangle, right? And, and that yield triangle basically shows how each user group should yield to each other. For us off-roaders, the most important thing that we need to know is, is that it's our responsibility to yield to all the other user groups, mountain bikers, hikers, horseback riders especially, right? 
horseback riders are so important because while we can control our four wheel drive vehicles, horseback riders can't always control their horses, right? And our loud vehicles and, and big vehicles could potentially scare those horses, but it's our job to yield. So if we are coming across some mountain bikers that possibly are crossing over the trail or even on the trail that we're on, it's our responsibility as vehicles to pull off to the side of the trail to allow the mountain bikers to move past us, right? The last thing we want is for one of them to hit a rock or something to happen and fall against the vehicle. Vehicle. So with hikers, same thing best to let them cross the trail or to move around us so that we're not kicking up dust uh, all over them or blaring our music as as we're driving by, those types of things. But horses, how we yield to them is super important, right? So first off, if we encounter horses on the trail, if horses are coming towards us, then we should pull our vehicles off to the lower side of the trail. Super important that we pull our vehicle off if, if one side higher than the other that we pull off and try to situate our vehicles lower than the horses because horses view natural instinct. They view things that are above them as a threat. So we pull our vehicles off to the side of the trail where we can, and we turn the engine off and we speak in a friendly tone, right? So that the horses know that we're human. If there's enough distance and enough time, it's sometimes even a good idea for us to get out of the vehicle so they can see that we're human. And they can identify with that and then allow the horses to pass by us, right? With no sudden movements, obviously don't slam a door right next to a horse or open a door right next to a horse, but just make sure that we keep our movements nice and calm and our voice stays nice and friendly and calm. If we pull up behind horses, you know, sometimes our vehicles are faster down the trail than a horse potentially is. But if we pull up behind a horse, then we should, again, turn the vehicle off and communicate with the rider how we should proceed, right? Because they understand what type of horse they have. So super important that we communicate. We pull up. We turn the vehicle off. Hey, how should we pass or how should we proceed? We're moving a little bit quicker. And they most of the time will step off to the side of the trail and let the vehicles proceed past. Again, keeping your RPMs low so we don't have a loud exhaust, no revving of the engine, and no loud music, right? So that's how we should yield with other user groups on the trail. And this is important, especially when you get into areas. Uari National Forest is a prime example. It kind of encompasses all the different user groups. You're just as likely to see a mountain biker or a hiker as you are a uh, horseback rider out there. And you can see this in a lot of different areas, especially on public lands. All right, let's talk about encountering other vehicles on the trails. So sometimes, and a lot of times, when we are on these trails, they are two-way traffic, right? But it's not always wide enough for everybody to pass. So who has the right-of-way? Well, there's some different factors that play into this. One, the guy with the biggest truck and the biggest tires has a right away. No, no, I'm just joking. But when we pull up with another group, a lot of times, if it's not on a hill climb, the right of way goes to the larger group, right? So it's harder for them to get off the trail than it is a smaller group to get off the trail. But it's always a generally a good idea for you to hold a hand out the window with how many people are in your group, right? If it's more than 10, right? You can't get it all with 10 fingers. Maybe it's a good idea just to pull up and say, hey, I've got 20 people in this group, right? And everyone down the line should do the same, right? How many people are behind me? Hey, there's four more vehicles, three more vehicles. When they get to the last vehicle, hold up a closed fist. Hey, I'm the last vehicle. You're clear from this point on. But that just lets the group know as they're passing by how many vehicles are in the group. And it's an easy way to tell which group is the largest so that they are the group that has a right of way. Now, if you are on a hill climb, it's always the vehicle moving uphill that has the right of way. The reason for this is, is that vehicle may need momentum to continue this hill climb. And if we don't give them the right of way and they have to stop, they may not be able to regain that momentum and they may have to back down the hill putting them in a dangerous situation, right? Backing down a failed hill, basically. 
it's easier because those of us that are going downhill, we have gravity on our side and we can use that to our advantage to get whatever momentum we need, which probably isn't a lot going downhill to help out. So always yield to the vehicles coming up the hill, whether they're a bigger group or a smaller group, or even if they're just one vehicle, make sure that you yield to that vehicle. Now, this doesn't mean that when you're yielding to the, whether it's the other oncoming group or whoever's coming up the trail, that we just pull all willy nilly off the trail, right? We need to find a suitable place to position our vehicle off the trail. Number one, to where we're not impacting and widening the trail, but number two, to where we can easily get our vehicle back on the trail without any damage. So don't pull off the side of the trail on a muddy slope where now you're going to try to back up and you're going to have to have some tire spin and stuff like that to get back on the trail. So make sure where you're pulling off the trail is, is adequate for your vehicle. Don't just go nosing off into the woods and knocking down trees with that big heavy duty steel bumper, right? So that's how we, we handle encountering other vehicles on the trail. Now, what about a group coming up behind us, right? Maybe a faster group, or maybe it's ATVs, uh, dirt bikes, or side-by-sides. And I know, I know, you, you know, that those vehicles can get aggravating on the trail, right? Because they, they get behind your group and then they're, you know, wanting to weave in and out. Well, it's because they do especially like dirt back dirt bike riders, they do move faster on the trail than us. And if they're behind a group of five or six, um, <laughs> five or six people uh, can really hold them up. So we typically, even with full size vehicles, we want to let a group that is faster pass by, right? We want them to, to be able to get past us to continue on down the trail. The more people that we hold up behind our group, the longer that kind of traffic jam starts to build up. So always let a faster group, just like a game of golf, right? You let a faster player play through. Well, we let a faster group or, or vehicles play through. Now, um, you know, sometimes you do have two big groups of 20 vehicles and 20 vehicles. And, and you can't always let, you know, 20 vehicles come past you. But at the first opportunity where you can, you know, maybe it comes to a fork in a trail and there's a trail to the left and a trail to the right. Maybe say, hey, guys, we're going left. Maybe you guys should go right. Or, hey, do you guys want to go left and we'll go right? You know, so so you can kind of communicate that out so that you don't end up over uh, over clogging a trail. Right. So always let those faster vehicles through like like uh, dirt bikes and side by sides and ATVs. Um, you know, and that, again, is respecting the rights of others because they are faster than us. And, and you know, if we were in a side by side, we want to go fast, too. Or on a dirt bike, we'd want to go fast, too. So keep that in mind. All right. Let's talk about some some convoy rules. OK, and, and these are some trail etiquette rules for bigger convoys on the trail or when you're even smaller convoys, these kind of play in. But these are really important because we do off road as a group. Very rarely are we going out by ourselves, and even sort of recommended that we don't go out by ourselves. But when we start getting up into groups of, you know, 10 vehicles, even five vehicles, but when we start getting into these bigger groups, there is some etiquette that plays into that. First and foremost, it is your responsibility in your convoy order to keep up with the person behind you. Do not make a turn where the other person behind you maybe is too far back or behind a bush or a rock and they can't see you make that turn. You should be keeping up with the people with the vehicle behind you. And if something happens and you stop to let them catch up, it should be a domino effect to the front. Obviously with radios, we can communicate, Hey, you know, vehicle four stopping. I don't see vehicle five, but also just making sure that you keep up with that vehicle behind you is super important. It's why a lot of times you'll see groups running with their headlights on. This doesn't mean running every LED light bar you got on your vehicle, but running with your headlights on does make it easier in dusty environments or uh, when it starts to get a little closer to dark, being able to see that vehicle a whole lot easier. So keeping up with the vehicle behind you. Don't make a turn unless they can see you make that turn and it will make your convoy move actually move quite a bit quicker because you'll be able to keep it together. You won't have to stop and let everybody catch up and 
say, ah, oh, where did Mike turn at? I don't know where he's at. Now we got to figure out how to get the group back together. So the other thing with Convoy is, is watch the vehicle in front of you to see how they navigate an obstacle, right? If we see them in an area where they are having a really hard time and they're spinning tires, that's an area that we know Maybe we need to avoid that. Again, avoid that sensitive area. If it's a real muddy rut and they're just spinning tires in that rut, maybe we can straddle that rut and avoid tearing up that sensitive area. So watch the vehicle in front of you and you can learn a lot from watching how that vehicle navigates an obstacle. And this is, um, especially in big convoys, I, I always kind of try to follow this rule of thumb, but it's three strikes and you're out on an obstacle. If you can't make it after three attempts, then it's time to recover you through that obstacle. Number one, so that we can keep the convoy moving efficiently. Number two, so that we're not just sitting there digging up that obstacle, right? And making it harder for every vehicle behind us. So three strikes, and then we're going to recover. If after three tries, you haven't made it, chances are you're not going to make it after that. So Give it the, the three good tries, then you just got to pack your ego away, pull winch cable, or hook up a strap and recover. So then if while you were on that obstacle and spinning tires, if you kicked a rock out or you dug a hole or whatever you did, repair that on the trail. Remember that even though you as the first vehicle were able to drive through easy, if you kicked out that basketball-sized rock that was used to step up on that ledge, well, now the vehicle behind you doesn't have that advantage. So you should put that rock back in place so that every vehicle has that advantage getting through. They may need that to continue on. Or if you dug a deep hole, maybe it's kick some rocks back in it so that it doesn't continue to become a bigger or larger rutted out hole down the line. So so repair what you damaged on the trail. And, you know, I'm not talking about, hey, every little softball sized rock. But knowing that, hey, this rock is here to help us step up into the next ledge, that's important, right, to repair that. Now, when we go out on trail rides, right, we know we have women and men both on the trail rides. And there's not a port -a john or a bathroom at every trail corner. So where do we go to the bathroom? All right. I always tell everyone, and, and this is also from Tread Lightly, but... Men go to the left-hand side of the trail. Women go to the right for the bathroom because women are always right, right? Just saying. So that's how we should separate. That way we don't run into any type of uncomfortable situation where you go off the trail to use the restroom and you stumble upon, you know, Miss Morrison out there while she's tinkling and, and then she screams and everybody goes crazy. So men or... Guys to the left, women to the right. Easy way to remember, women are always right, so they go right, okay? And that's when applicable. Sometimes you get on trails that switch back, back and forth. Um, just be careful, right, that you are in a, in a secluded area. And don't leave the little white dandelion flowers out in the woods, right? If you have to, dig a hole and bury it or pack it out, okay? That's super important. Um, so that's how we should use kind of the restroom on the trail. Now, talking a little bit about respecting the rights of others, being understanding when we're traveling on the trail as a big convoy or even a small convoy, but loud music and loud exhaust and our language, right? How we talk. Sometimes we get a little rowdy on the trail and maybe language gets a little heated. Uh, you know, uh, guys get together and we start, you know, talking all kinds of stuff and, and the language language can be a little bit rowdy. But remember that some people may be out there with families, right? Be out there with kids and they may not want to have, you know, a certain type of music being blared really loud um, with bad language or they may not want to hear your bad language on the trail and have their kids hear that. So so just making sure that we're respecting the other uh, people that are on the trail with how we're uh, conducting ourselves, right? We always want to conduct ourselves in a, in a responsible manner, respecting those rights of others. Um, and this is really important, okay, when we're traveling through campsites, especially as a big convoy. If we're pulling through a campsite somewhere, you know, like Uari National Forest, there's areas out there where 
four or five people can be camping in a group on the side of the trail. And it's 24 hours, seven days a week there um, when the trails are open. So when we drive past, not revving the engine, no loud exhaust, keeping our speed down so that we're not kicking up dust while they're trying to eat dinner or while they're trying to sleep, but definitely not blaring our music as we're driving through, you know, nice and easy, just pull through that area, uh, you know, until you get far enough away uh, to where uh, it's not going to bother them if you start to pick up the pace a little bit with a few higher RPMs while you're driving on the trail. Uh, but again, still keeping your RPMs down because noise can travel a pretty good distance through the woods. So that's uh, that's some good thoughts on traveling through a campsite or Forest Service Road, right? Um, and remember on those Forest Service Roads dry season, how easy it is to kick up dust and how it can just become a really big dust cloud and a dangerous situation, right? Because now we can't see um, and we're trying to drive along. I've seen tons of accidents in, in, on Forest Service roads just because of how dusty it gets. So keep that type of stuff in mind um, when we're thinking about kind of our trail etiquette and how we should kind of conduct ourselves on the trail uh, as we're moving along. Now, some of the uh, some of the other things, not necessarily as big and applicable here on the East Coast, but sometimes we do run into this, especially if we have permission to drive on private land or things like that. But one thing that we really want to know before we go somewhere, and again, this really goes back to educating ourselves, is whose land are we on? Okay, is it Forest Service land? Is it BLM land? Is it state land? Is it private land? Whose land are we on? Do we have permission to be there? When we get out there, figuring out if we have permission to be out there, but also reading the signage that we run up on, okay? Because it may say when we pull up in somewhere, you know, hey, you're going to encounter gates. All lock gates are closed, do not bypass. Or, hey, you know, these types of, of vehicles are allowed on this trail. Maybe it's vehicles that are less than 50 inches wide or, or something along those lines. Um, but reading those signs to understand what they mean, and abide by the rules that are posted on those. That's a huge part of trail etiquette. A lot of people will just bypass right through and not read a sign because, hey, we're ready to get on the trail. But stopping and reading that signage so that we understand right, what we're doing, it may tell you something important like, hey, this trail goes from green to blue to black, and you're just out for a nice leisurely Saturday ride. Um, and next thing you know, you're on a black trail that you're not prepared for. Um, or your vehicle may not be prepared for. Um, so understanding that reading that signage is super important. Now, especially out west, if you are traveling on public lands, um, sometimes you do cross over private lands for a small section um, and it, through a right of way or something along those lines. But even on public lands, sometimes you come across a gate, right? A gate that's shut, or maybe it's a gate that's open. But it's your responsibility if it's Again, not going through a locked gate, but if the gate is unlocked and you are allowed to be in that area, leave the gate how you found it. If you pass through as a group, say 10 vehicles, and you pass through that gate, make sure that the last vehicle knows and that you give them time to lock that gate back or sh sorry, shut that gate back. If you pass through an area and a gate is open, make sure you leave that gate open. There may be a farmer, rancher, someone out there, and they're doing something and they're coming right back through, but leave that gate open. Um, so leaving kind of the gates as we found them, right? Leave it as we found them. So um, some other trail etiquette, and again, this is kind of stuff with do your part, but it's pick up, pack in what you, uh, pack out what you pack in, right? Leave no trace. Make sure you are you are carrying out all of your trash, right? Now, sometimes, you know, you're sitting around a campfire in the evening and things like that, and you're like, hey, I could just burn this whatever, right? This this half-empty can of ketchup or bottle of ketchup or, or these paper plates and stuff like that. Um, or, hey, this apple core that I'm eating while I'm driving down the trail, I can just throw this out the window. It's biodegradable, right? But when you do that, or you're burning something in a fireplace, you're introducing something to an ecosystem that it 
isn't normally there, right? An animal suddenly gets starts eating apple cores all the time. And they love apple cores. They will get used to following um, vehicles, thinking that every time they're going to get an apple core. A good story that I like to share is, is if you go to Nemo's Tunnel in Tennessee, right outside of Windrock Park, there is a little baby deer out there that has followed so many Jeeps and Toyotas and four-wheel drive vehicles through there and been fed that it just hangs out there and follows people around waiting for food, right? So it happens very easily. Um, so, you know, keep that trash and stuff inside the vehicle. If you burn stuff in a fire pit, there may be some remnants left over and animals can get into that and uh, they can then become dependent on that. Again, talking about convoys or even by yourself on the trail, be cautious about where you guys stop. Sometimes on the trail, we, we pull around a corner and, you know, we see this awesome view or we've got our awesome four wheel drive vehicle flexed out on this one rock and we want to get out and take a picture, right? If it's in a blind curve or it's somewhere that's going to slow down the flow of traffic, it's not really appropriate for us to do that. I know we want to take a picture for the gram and hashtag it, put it all out there, but sometimes it's just not appropriate to do that. So make sure that when you do stop somewhere that you are doing it in an adequate area where people can see where you're stopped and they can easily get past your vehicle without going off trail. So um, this is a biggie, guys. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir. And the only reason I bring this up is because uh, we put this up on YouTube. So do not absolutely positively do not drink and drive. Right. Even if I know it's it's easy to say, hey, I just want to have one beer with lunch or one beer with dinner or, hey, we hung out around the campfire and we had a couple of beers. We're ready to go back out on the trail. Do not drink and drive. Right. It's super important. First off, if you're going on public roads, it's illegal. Um, places like Windrock Park and places like that, they do a, a really good job of preventing that. Um, and it's it's very, very important that we don't do that, because, again, not only could we have an accident and it be very dangerous, but we are not uh, conducting ourselves in a good manner. Um, and we want to continue to kind of improve the image of us as off-roaders. Um, so most definitely do not drink and drive. The last thing, uh, the last thing we want to do is get to a situation where somebody sees something going on. All right. So guys, that's um, a lot of, uh, trail etiquette at once, but a um, couple of things I want to touch on before we get we bring Al back on and we kind of get off of here. Um, two things, and these are kind of big pet peeves of mine. Uh, number one, um, stop to help others, right? Super important, regardless of the user group. Stop to help others. This, if we stop and there's horseback riders or mountain bikers or hikers on the side of the trail and we offer them water, that helps a ton with their view of us, right? Their view of us as off-roaders. The other important one I want to bring up is don't leave anyone behind. If if Jim Bob Morrison, you know, breaks down on the trail in his Toyota, don't leave him behind, right? Stay there, help him out. If they can't get the vehicle fixed, then figure out how to tow it back, right? Or at the very least, you can drive to somewhere, take them somewhere where they can get what they need and then go back and fix the vehicle. The last thing we want to do is, is leave someone behind. Okay. Now, um, what I kind of want to talk about at the end here, and then we'll bring Al back on is how we manage the groups that we encounter that aren't necessarily following, following these trail etiquette tips, right? And this is super important, guys, because we know that our public lands or our, pub, our public access as off-roaders is in jeopardy, right? Everywhere we go, it's, it's always something. It's super important, right? Super important how we manage ourselves. And I see it all the time of someone sees something, someone doing something wrong on the trail and they're in. And our first thing to do is to take a picture of them with their cell phone, right? And then upload it to Facebook. Look what look what Mike's doing on the trail, right? And we text it on there, put it on the gram, and we hashtag it, and then it goes crazy, right? It's it's out there in the world. Guys, stop and talk to whoever is doing what's going on. Doesn't have to be mean or angry or whatever. 
just stop and talk. Go up to them. Perfect situation is you pull up, someone's camping off to the side of the trail, and you notice all of their trash, right, is in the fire pit. Maybe it's bagged up, but it's in the fire pit, and they're getting ready to leave. So I've experienced this, and I've seen it before, where I pulled up and I introduced myself to a family, right? A family on the side of the trail. And I say, hey, guys, how are you doing? And we talk for a few minutes, and I say, hey, would you mind if I carry your your bag trash out for you? And they say, and the people actually told me in this situation, they said, oh, no, somebody comes by and picks all this up. We saw a couple other campsites where the trash was left in the fire pit. They were oblivious, guys. They were oblivious. They would have never known because other campers had done this in front of them. They would have never known that it was their responsibility to pack out that trash, right? New to off-roading, new to camping. They lived in the city, right? Never really spent much time outdoors. They'd gone to Walmart and bought a tent and they went camping with their kids. It literally was their first camping experience as a family. How I approached them, again, was was very, very nice. You know, I talked to them, introduced myself. We talked about vehicles. We found common ground, right? We found common ground about enjoying the outdoors, enjoying off-roading and camping. And then I went in to ask them if I could carry their trash out. I didn't accuse them of not carrying their trash out. But it opened up an awesome opportunity to converse with this family about Tread Lightly and about responsible outdoor recreation right by the time we were done they were all fired up about man i can't believe you know that we that we were thinking this we need to go out we need to share this with everyone that's right that's what we need to do that is the most important part of do your part it's not to snap pictures and public shame people on social media because what that does is just give others ammunition against us right our most important job is to interact with those individuals that are doing wrong and find common ground and then teach them the correct ways, right? We don't have to beat them over the head. That can wait till later, right? When they're not listening further on down the road. But again, find common ground and interact with them. Super important, guys. All right, Al, you ready to come back on and, and maybe you've got some, some areas to fill in or some good questions for me? Well, you were, <clears throat> excuse me, you were talking about campfires. So, and people putting their trash in. That's not, probably not the best way to put a campfire out. But Deborah wanted to know if you can give us some pointers on how to put a campfire out, out and make sure that it's really out. Yes, yes, most definitely. So if you have a campfire, depending on where you're at, there's a couple of options. One, um, you know, follow whatever the rules and regulations for where you are. Um, because some public lands have rules with how you should dispose of your campfire. Some places don't want you to bury it, right? Like uh, camping on Portsmouth Beach on the Outer Banks, you can't bury your fire. You have to carry out your coals with you. Um, so understand that first you should follow the rules of whoever um, you're recreating at. If there are no rules, then first you should douse it with water to put it out as best as possible. Then spread out your coals a little bit so that they can have time to kind of die out, making sure that we're not leaving anything behind that could re-catch on fire. Then I always recommend throwing some dirt or something on top to kind of <clears throat> douse out the flame, right? Making sure, again, that there's nothing that could reignite after we leave out of there. Um, that's why it's also super important. Again, not burning trash, right? Not throwing stuff on the fire because things like paper plates and napkins and stuff like that can turn into flying debris that can reignite kind of at a later time. So a lot of forest fires have been started that way. So put it out with water, then you can throw a little bit of soil on top of it if available. Um, if not available, it could be a good idea to carry, you know, like a metal bucket or something where you can pack out your coals um, and, and keep them uh, or dispose of them once they have cooled off appropriately. But who can you call if you're out there and you get into a recovery situa situation and, and you're beyond your, your own capability and the capability of the group? Is there anyone you can call? Now, uh, Randy, so, Lynn, Randy Lynn replied back to Deborah. Uh, can I show two comments at once? And she, she gave this, Mike, over if it's in North Carolina, South Carolina area and gave the phone number. So 
So go from there, Mark. A lot of times there is, um, there are volunteer organizations, depending where you're at. Groups like Overt, off, um, uh, Overt is basically a, a off-road vehicle emergency response team. They do a good job of going out and helping with recoveries, helping with uh, natural disasters and stuff like that. And, and a lot of states have groups like this that are very organized that can go out and help you with a recovery. Okay. Um, so that's not necessarily just a North Carolina specific. If you educate yourself about where you're going ahead of time, then you can kind of learn about which groups are there to kind of help you out. There's, I know, especially when you get out West, like Colorado and Utah, there's, there's multiple groups to kind of help you out. But in the event that it is an emergency, right? Obviously dialing 911 is your best bet. Um, typically my recommendation is kind of ahead of time is if you're going out, let someone know, Hey, I'm leaving at this time and I will be back or I will be in touch by this time. So that if something does happen and you can't call out for help, at least they know where you're at and what's going on and when to expect you back. Um, and that's, you know, as easy as, hey, text a friend, you'll hear from me in five hours. I'm going off-roading in, you know, Colmont, right? I'm going off-roading at Adventure Off-Road Park. So uh, that's one way of doing it. Um, but obviously, uh, groups like Overt and stuff like that, a lot of them are trained in recovery. Um, I know I've done a lot of training with Overt in the past with Scott Fields. Um, so a lot of them are trained to do recoveries. When you're planning a ride, where's the best place to find information about the park or the trail? So, uh, wow, this is a this is a loaded question. But um, social media is a good way to start, right? Finding out. Um, I know there's a lot of a lot of different groups that you can post in uh, about finding information about a trail. The the groups page. Uh, like Windrock, if you're going to go to Windrock, you can post on their page. Southern Four Wheel Drive Association is a great resource to post up on their Facebook page because they're the entire Southeast guys, and most of the people that are that are long term members have been to areas even outside of that. So they're a great resource. Outside of that, there are a ton of apps on your uh, on your available for your phone that can help kind of with the navigation and trail selection um, kind of thought process. If if you sign up for one of our uh, Morrison Outdoor uh, Adventures uh, Wednesday Night Essentials classes, we actually talk about navigation and the apps available to you. Um, but there are a lot of apps out there that can help you with kind of mapping out those routes, but there's not really one central location uh, that does it all. Okay, Mike, we've got another one here. Miss Randy Lynn Rosa, when convoying in a big dust cloud, what's the recommended distance between vehicles? I've heard that closer is easier to see. It, that's, a, that's a tough one answer, I know. That is a tough one. It, a lot of that depends on your speed, right? How, much, how fast are you going? If you're, if you're traveling at a little higher rate of speed, like on forest service roads, you really need to leave adequate stopping distance. Um, and then some, you're not going to be able to get close enough uh, in that dust cloud to keep eyesights on that person. So you need to leave enough distance for the dust to dissipate enough and uh, you to be able to stop in the event of emergency. So typically, if we're, you know, traveling down Forest Service roads, I really urge everyone to keep five to six vehicle lengths apart, even though that really spreads you out. Um and again, keeping your speed down to keep that dust down. If you're on the trail and you're traveling very slow, four-wheel drive, low range, you know, five to 10 miles an hour, you can keep, you know, two vehicle lengths in between of you very easily in, in dusty environments. But also that's why I do recommend running your lights uh, when you're out on the trail as a group, even in the daytime. Good. Okay. Guess. What? Deborah has another question. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Deborah, we love you. We're picking on you because we love you. Thank you for asking the questions. It just helps everybody learn, okay? In a group, how do you line people up, Mike? Ones with experience? Do you have a CB, the capability of your rig? What's the best lineup? you got a group of 10 people, and they all vary in experience. Some have CBs, some don't. Some have stock vehicles, and some have built vehicles. 
So how I line up groups like in my trail rides, number one is based on vehicles capability, right? I always try to put the the least capable vehicles towards the front of the group. I typically don't do it based on experience because experience is, is hard to gauge, right? Um, so I do it based on vehicle capability. Now, this is for me guiding a trail. I also look at how a vehicle is equipped with whether it has a winch or not. I always make sure in a, in a convoy that I line it up winched vehicle, non-winch, winch vehicle, non-winch, so that at least this vehicle, maybe it doesn't have a winch, but it has one in front of it and behind it in the event of recovery. For communications, what I do is uh, I do try to spread out the most uh, the most communication as I can throughout the group. That way, if at least something happens, the people in the middle are at least bookended uh, by communication. My most, if if I know the drivers and I can judge their experience, my most experienced drivers, one goes in the front of the group and one goes in the rear of the group. Typically, my most experienced driver and and most capable vehicle will be the last vehicle in the group. And again, this is kind of for how I set up my guided trail rides, but I've just found that it that it works really well doing it that way. Mike, we've noticed that a lot of people are moving from CB radios to GMRS, the little Midland radios, and even yeah. FRS, those radios. Uh, I'm, I'm finding personally that that, communication using those devices rather than cb is a lot more reliable and it's working really good for us in our little groups it does it does the the little uh midland gmrs radios i use those in a trail ride of 13 14 vehicles and sometimes we're you know a mile and a half apart and we have no problems communicating good okay um here we go randy land randy land says the Full size OHV and four wheelers and side by sides always share the same set of trails at each park. Or do some parks have designated trails for each? Some parks do have designated trails. Um, like at Windrock, there are some trails out there that are designated specifically for side by side, so we can't take full size vehicles on them. Uh, some some trail systems do completely separate side by sides and uh, full size. Some trail systems just will only allow some specific uh, uh, types of vehicles, right? So a lot of times that's based on uh, the area that you're going to. But again, that's super important that you kind of educate yourself uh, about the area that you're going to. For instance, here in Western North Carolina, there are some forest service trails out here that are only for motorcycles, right? They're only for like dirt bikes. Um, I think anything that is over a certain uh, width is not allowed. Um, so you can't take a full size vehicle on those trails, you know, and some of them are up to a uh, a side by side, but you still couldn't take a Jeep or a Suzuki Samurai, a really narrow vehicle on those trails. Um, so and again, you know, some parks, they do separate those uh, style vehicles out. Okie doke. Okay. Anything else, guys? Um, um, go ahead. I just, you know, guys, uh, as per usual, right? Make sure that you guys like this and share it with everybody, right? Share it on your personal Facebook page. Share it in your club page. Tell your mom, your dad, aunt, uncle, dogs, hairdresser, dentist. I, I, I don't care. Tell them about it. Right. You never know. They might be into off roading. And and just to kind of piggyback on what Al said about telling everybody, I charge everyone at this episode. So looking at it right now, we have thirty nine people viewing thirty nine people viewing and or forty viewing the live stream right now. So we should have eighty at the next tech net because everybody needs to bring at least one friend. Let's have a tech net. I want to have a tech net that has over a hundred people watching it live, right? Over a hundred people watching Southern Four Wheel Drive Association educate live. Jay? I would I would like to remind everybody about Trail Fest. Trail Fest is coming up first weekend in May, you know, right at the end of April to, to, to May 2nd. 
make sure that you register um, beforehand so that we know we got t-shirts, we got trail rides. You are going to be able to go on a trail ride with, with Michael Morrison. You're going to be able to meet him and figure out. And, and so we've got some great training stuff going on. Al's, I got to get to the right point. And Al's going to be there. You can meet Al in person. You might even meet the ice cream man who will be out on the trails, probably giving you ice cream. Remember what Southern does. You know, we do education, which is what you're doing here. We're doing some great tread lightly stuff going on. Conservation, which we talked about, Colmont and helping out with Daniel Boone back into Byway. And of course, recreation, which is Trail Fest, Dixie Run, and uh, so so get out there and uh, and have some fun. The weather's starting to change, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing everybody out on the trails. All right, so that's it. Thanks a lot. All we down to 36 now, but all all you guys that are still with us. Thanks a lot for hanging in there. So there we are. We'll all right. Thank end you. this thing now. Bye, everybody. Night, guys.